Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, so this is a joint work with Zing Wang, who's in the audience, Nancy Lynch, uh, Muriel Medard, uh, who are at MIT, and Peter Murcial, who's at uh, EMC Corporation. Okay. So this is an application of distributed storage systems. And the applications are what I've shown here. Suppose I have a distributed storage system, and I want to use, the use it to store, say, the stock market. Uh, stock market data, or let's say I want to use it for distributed computing, for cloud computing and things like that. In these systems, well, you want it to be a well-oiled distributed storage system. So you want failure tolerance, you want low storage costs, you want fast reads and writes. In addition to these standard constraints, there's another constraint that is called consistency. That is, the, if the value is changing, if your stock, stock value is changing, when I read, I should get the latest value of the stock. Now, in the application of distributed computing, suppose one processor changes the value of some variable, another processor that is reading the value from this uh, distributed storage system should get the changed value. Okay. So the goal of this talk is to understand how some, some quantities about this, uh, about implementing a consistent distributed storage. So as the theme of the workshop is from practice to theory, so the practice, the application that I am interested in is uh, implementing a consistent distributed storage. Uh, the goal is to use tools of information theory, coding theory, to understand costs or performance, to understand storage costs, to understand communication costs of this of a consistent distributed storage system. So to do, to do this, we need a model, right? So we want to understand this theoretically, we need a model. So this has been modeled and well studied in, in the field of distributed computing. There's a problem called the shared memory emulation problem in distributed computing that models this notion of consistency in storage systems. So in this talk, I'll talk about, I'll introduce the shared memory emulation problem, and then I'll talk about a coding theory or an information theory problem that tries to understand the costs of this shared memory emulation problem. So, the shared memory emulation is a proxy for the application. This, this model is the proxy for the application. Okay. So I'll begin with a brief history of shared mem memory emulation. So it, th these concepts were originally uh, formulated by Lampert. Uh, the idea of a consistency, or what is called atomicity, was uh, formulated by Lampert in uh, 1986. And it has gone on to become a cornerstone of distributed computing and multiprocessor programming. If you study things like databases, you understand that uh, one of the things you learn is this concept of an atomic shared memory. Another uh, place where people learn this commonly is when, they, when you learn multiprocessor programming, uh, when people use an atomic shared memory to make the threads talk to each other. So these are standard co concepts in several computer science courses. Okay, are you going to explain us exactly what that I will explain it to you approximately what it is. I won't define define this. Um, so uh, this is a concept, an atomic shared memory is a concept. Uh, the question is, if I want to use a distributed sh uh, storage dis distributed storage system to uh, emulate this concept, there's this field of emulation, shared memory emulation in distributed systems. One of the first algorithms that came up, it's uh, abbreviated as the ABD algorithm in, uh, after the author's uh, names. And this, this actually won, won the Dijkstra Prize in 2011. So it's, one of the, it's a celebrated algorithm in this field. And actually, modern data centers which implement databases, like the Amazon Dynamo Key Value Store, the algorithms that they use in these data centers actually mimic these, these uh, algorithms that I'll talk about. But the main thing is these are fault tolerant algorithms, so they, uh, they build fault tolerance into the, in the storage system. The main thing is that they are replication based. That is where we would come in. Right? So I'll talk about some challenges and ideas for using coding for, for, for shared memory emulation. And these challenges will inspire my multi-version coding problem, which I'll describe later. Okay. So let me just introduce these concepts uh, briefly. So uh, the model is the following. You have a distributed storage systems. You have several servers. 
you have cli you have a client uh, server architecture so server store values clients are things that come and want to write or read a value so imagine a single value being stored a write client essentially wants to update this value a read client wants to come in and it 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 wants to read values from the system it typically wants to read the latest value clients and servers are connected connected through point to point links that's how they that's how they communicate the model for the links is that they, they it's like a traffic in california i begin i uh, reach my destination i don't know when i reach there because of the traffic but i reach there so these are point to point reliable asynchronous links um nodes can fail clients and ser the server nodes and client nodes can fail uh, but it's a distributed architecture so i don't know when another node fails or i don't know anything about the state of any other node except from the messages I, that i exchange from the world i know the topology but i don't know the current state when it fails whether it has failed except from the messages so i think this is a good model it turns out to be a useful model i think this is because as storage systems scale it it's harder to achieve synchronization it's harder to achieve some kind of coordination so i think these models have turned out to be useful for these large scale storage systems for this reason okay this is the model underlying model what's our goal what what should i do so the goal is to design protocols for these so the algorithms protocols for these uh, let's see for the clients right right protocols for the right clients server protocols and read protocols so that's the goal yep so if if two right clients try to write concurrently on the same disk okay, is it so one of the two the one who writes later will be written fully or is it some garbage of the two bits will mix up how does it work so the links are pipelines that's fine the links are fine but i'm saying if i try to write 000101 and you concurrently with me try to write something as one so way. you write first your write is implemented first and then my write is okay so my write will it's an atomic yeah okay so it's not that i will write half of my bits then your bits get on top of no so i mean even if that happens that abstraction is not captured here it it's a uh, it's a single operation okay that's the model Fair right yeah. any other questions so it's not overwritten nothing is Uh, except on purpose that might be the client server protocol might say overwrite it but the channel by itself doesn't overwrite it that's the model okay. so the goal is to design these protocols so that the, the operations are concurrent so i should be able to come and write and uh, return even if there are other operations happening in parallel so you want concurrent reads and writes uh it's not like one one right client comes and locks the entire storage system that that should not happen that's the first uh, requirement the second requirement is consistency or atomicity okay so atomicity as i mentioned is uh, was introduced by lampert in 86 if you want to understand algorithms for this over this architecture that people use you need to understand the precise definition of atomicity here i'll only tell you what is required for this talk Right. what is required for the later coding problem that we need right. uh this is uh, as i mentioned a butchered definition of at atomicity for simplicity so the idea is the following after a write operation completes any read that begins after the write completes should either return the value of that write or it should return the value of a write that overlaps with this write so that either begins after begins in the interval or ends in the interval of this right or it should return the value of a write that begins after this write completes right. so any later read should return the most reasonable thing can you explain what is an overlapping write yeah let me show this picture so uh, uh this 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 the bottom is the read the top is the write so the bottom thing should return v of 1 it shouldn't return something older Right. Sorry, what, what is this notation? What is what the top is a re this is time horizontal axis is time. V one mean the it? first value. It's just a indicator of the value. So that means that somebody started writing V one and then finished writing it there, and then somebody right. else started. So the write protocol. Let's start. Sorry. Yeah. 
It started here and finished there. Okay, so some blue person wrote V1 and then another some blue person blue. read it. Right, it started reading and ended reading here and it returned V1. Okay, and then this, this uh, green yellow thing is somebody else. Right, it can be the same person, somebody else, it's a d distributed system, but... Th and V2 is a different place in memory or a different value? Or it's a different value started by a client. Okay. So somebody same. else came and wanted to update this value. Same place? It's same place. at the same variable. That just same changed. variable, same variable. It okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why, why, why when this person, the second blue read there, is still going to read V1? Yeah, so the idea is that the, the, rules are, the rules come in after the write completes. So after the edge of this, any future one should be able to see it. That's the, that's the main idea. When, there, there are no, no rules, I mean there are, but I'm not mentioning them, there are no rules about something that happened here. If there was a write that started, he, started here and ended here, right. so then this could have returned one of those two, that's what I mean by the overlapping writes. Okay. Well, how about the two V2s under there? The V2 write hasn't finished, but on the top? Yeah, this could have returned, this can return this. It should return something, this or something later, something that started later. Okay. It should, it, it, yeah. So it's not even necessarily... That, that's, this is fair game. If it happens, if this happens in it's the... It's not really deterministic. It need not, it's not necessarily... The only, the only thing you're enforcing is that after the... After the edge at which it... Two, after V2 has ended, right. if another read happens, you don't allow V1. That's exactly, you exactly. Prefer. But you can allow V4, no, because that has not started. I mean, it's physically not plausible, but it's, I guess, the rules don't... Could the third read, which is concurrent with V2, could it return V1? Yes. Yeah, why? Yeah, no, that, that's not possible. But I'm not... Uh, that You don't need to know that for what follows, but that's not possible. Okay, so if there is... The, the, the there are hidden the, things in the... Once we switch to two, we never go back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's, you don't need to know this, these intricacies for what follows. <laughs> okay, this will make a bit more sense as we go along, hopefully. Right. So I'll give an idea of the algorithm to make, maybe that gives more sense. So the ABD algorithm, as I mentioned, is a replication-based replication -based algorithm. Uh, the idea is that I write, I have cor a quorum set. Quorum set is just a majority. The idea is that if I write, write to a quorum and read from a quorum, anybody that reads, uh, because two, any two quorums intersect, a write is visible to any future read. So I write to a majority of servers, I read from a majority of servers, any two guys which intersect, uh, intersect uh, get, can get access to, a, can, can see this written value. That's the main idea. I, because I don't know when, when I send a packet to this guy, I don't know if it has failed or not. So I'll just, uh, this should be, become more sense in these pictures. So there's a value that comes up. This is the right protocol. It sends the value to all the servers. Right. And then the servers send an acknowledgement. That's the server protocol. As long as it gets values from a quorum, from a majority, it returns. That's, that's basically the right protocol. Similarly, a read sends a read request to all the servers. Right? It doesn't know who has failed, who is alive. It sends packets to everybody. Servers respond with, their, with the value that they store. As long as it gets values from at least one quorum, it picks the highest timestamped value and it returns that highest timestamped value. So this makes the ABD algorithm look very simple and trivial. There are actually additional steps. The read actually has to has an additional write back step and things like that. I'm not going to talk about those details because they're not relevant to the problem. But there is some there there is some tricky uh, mathematics behind this behind proving that this this algorithm is is atomic. But the most important thing to remember in this, uh, for this talk is that ABD uses replication for fault tolerance. Right? That's the most important thing to remember. Because of the majority thing? Huh? Because of the majority thing? Yeah. Because of the majority thing? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, it, that's how the protocol works. They you just use replication. They didn't think about performance or storage costs or communication costs. And repli it works because of majority. So let's try to do coding with this and see some of the some of the challenges involved. Okay. So the I'll just show show this show the idea of coding through an through a six four MDS code. So. I have a packet, right? And I divide it into four parts and then generate two, say, linear combinations to get a 6 4 MDS code. So any four packets get me my value. And the standard coding argument should hopefully apply. Since each of these packets is just a quarter, if every server stores just a quarter of the value, and if I just communicate uh, just smaller packets, I should save both on storage costs and communication costs, hopefully. But there's a new constraint for this because of this consistency. The new constraint is that a, a reader, a decoder, should get four packets of the same of the same timestamp. So there's an additional implied synchrony that, that has to be uh, ensured by the protocol. So this creates some interesting challenges. So I'll show a coding coding example. So here a quorum should has to be, has to be five server nodes because any two quorums have to intersect in four nodes. I need four people to reconstruct a packet. When I write and when I read, there has to be an intersection of four people for me to reconstruct. A quorum is just uh, some, uh, a subset of server nodes. The idea is that if I write to five nodes and you read from five nodes, we'll intersect in, uh, in at least four nodes. So my write is, uh, you will be able to see my value. Was it not clear? Or? Quorum is just a word for the number of people I have to access. The minimum number of people I need to talk to before returning. So let me demonstrate why this is challenging. So let's say a write comes, it's, it sends value V, it sends coded packets to everybody. Uh, this packet, so the original state is this. Uh, this sends packets to everybody, right? And these are smaller packets. This reaches and these guys are stuck in traffic. I want concurrent operations. So let's say a read comes and sends read requests. Right? These are asynchronous links. The order can be anything. Now what should this guy do? What should this return? This reader needs, needs four packets of the same timestamp. Okay. How do you know? Both. Right. So how there? So this this is interesting question. Firstly, I cannot erase the new old packet. I need to store some history to achieve this synchronization that coding imposes. Right. So that's that's one challenge. Another is what should I what I should reveal to a new reader is also quite uh, quite challenging. It's not obvious what I should reveal to the new. Why not put a timestamp and the reader just keep out of the stuff he gets <coughs> keep the most recent one? What's the problem with that? It would involve sending a lot. Firstly, how much it would involve storing a lot of history. It's in, it would involve sending a lot of lot of packets to the reader. No, but all I'm saying is, every time you write something to one of them, I, I'm go, I'm sto I know when you wrote it, right? So I have a timestamp. Uh, we can assume that, yeah. Right. That's, so then, when when the read client asks for it. Uh, like the people will give him, okay, this is my what I think it is at time t minus one. But one of them will say, well, this is what I think it is at time t, and he will look at them and only keep the what? What's the, am I missing something? No, uh, the asynchrony maybe. Uh, this packet, the read can have started after the write or before the. Okay. I, I didn't quite understand your question, but I think you might be missing the asynchrony. Why don't you just send the timestamps and then the. Is that a lot? Yeah, so that that's a part of the protocol. I won't go into the protocol, but the yes. protocol initially reads some time. Okay. Protocol initially agrees on some timestamps. But I, all I want to convey is that this is not completely obvious that you get the gains of coding in the most natural way. That's the only thing I want to convey here. And be, these are some of the challenges. And yeah, we, I can go into more details of the algorithmic aspects offline. So these challenges have been recognized by people in this field. People started working back in 2004 to implement erasure coding. And there have been many algorithms, which uh, we also wrote a paper recently. 
uh, the differences between these algorithms are like, as I mentioned, some pa some some algorithms send the entire history to so that incur incurs a large communication cost. Different al some algorithms don't do any garbage collection; they store the entire history. Right? So we solved some of these challenges, and I'm like as mentioned, I can talk about the algorithmic aspects um, offline. Right. So the insights I'll just summarize the insights from these algorithms. So, so the insights are the following. Servers must store symbols corresponding to multi multiple versions. I cannot just keep one coded packet and uh, make the algorithm work. Right. And the number of coded packets that I keep actually is related to the amount of concurrency in the system. So the number of coded pa if the number of writes that are concurrent with the read is larger, then this, my storage cost actually increases for for coding, for, for these algorithms. So the question that motivated our problem is the following. Are these costs fundamental? Is this dependency on concurrency fundamental? Or is there, can I use some clever coding ideas to do something better for this, for this uh, shared memory emulation problem? So this is the main motivation for our, for, for the talk, for the coding problem that I'll talk about. Any questions so far? Or? There's just one thing that bothers me a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure why does it do, why does it uh, allow you to retrieve version two once version two starts to being written uh, is being written. I mean, in your diagram, that, you that's just the uh, rules of the game. So that is that's. But, uh, if the writing is not done, how can I access? That? It it could have happened here, even here in ABD, right? Oh, you can just start reading and you don't have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Because the concurrency is allowed, so. It's allowed to yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks, sorry. So it's a carefully thought out definition, actually, the atomicity. Uh, you can't, it's harder to come up with a stronger definition, stronger ordering. But those are just the rules of the game, which, yeah. Okay, so. So now I'll talk about the coding problem. So this is a coding problem, which I talked about yesterday as well, but let me just redefine uh, it. So the coding problem is the following. I have a storage system, right? <coughs> I have many versions that I need to support. A version one comes, so I, just in this picture, I am assuming version one is there everywhere. Version two comes in and then it's received by some servers and not received by some servers, right? And so on. So each server gets some subset of versions because of the inherent asynchrony in this system. A decoder should access some subset of some specified number of subset of servers, and the rule of the game is that it should decode the latest common version or something something later. So a decoder can meet these two and return it has to return version two. A decoder that accesses these two guys can return version one that is thought of as fair. A decoder that accesses, connects these two should return version one or version two. So that's the goal of the coding problem. Right. So each server stores a function of the versions it has heard from. So in general, a client connects to C servers and de demands the latest common version among the V, among the subset of servers it connects to. Okay. So the three parameters are n servers, v versions, and c is the connectivity. And the goal of my coding problem is to minimize the worst case storage cost. Right. There are two solutions we already saw, replication and coding. The goal is to figure out what's the smallest storage cost. This is just a first order problem that we are looking at. You can talk about communication costs and add other things on top of it which are actually relevant to the problem, but this is what I'll Storage cost is what I'll talk about here. Okay. And the two, the, there are two natural solutions based on, you might already guess these. The two natural solutions are, the first one is replication. So each one just store, each server just stores the latest of all the versions, the message in its entirety. That's a replication based solution. And the storage size is the size of one version. The other naturally obvious solution is that a server does not delete anything among the V versions. Each one stores a different coded packet for all the versions it has heard from. 
And in this case, again, you can see that if I connect to any C servers, sorry, any C servers, I can get the latest common version. Uh, and the storage size is, the worst case storage size is the total number of version times by C. Because each one uses an NC MDS code, V versions is V by C. Each server stores V by C bits. Okay. So the, you have these two baseline solutions. The question is how, better, how much better you can get. The main message is you can improve, by, improve these, but not by a lot. So our code constructions, we have code constructions which achieve 1 by C by V. So there's an integrality thing that you can save on. This can be twice as good as this, up to twice as good as this. And there's a lower bound which essentially says that this is optimal. So at least the first order thing is that if my number of concurrent versions becomes large, I, I approach replication. Okay. Uh, how much time do I have? Okay, I'll just explain the achievability and not explain the converse. The achievability is the following. I have, uh, I part, so given any state, I make the following partition. A server is in partition 1 if version 1 is the latest version. Server is in partition 2 if version 2 is the latest version. So given any state, any subset of versions, I make this partition. So there are at most V partitions. So there is at least one partition in, with C by V servers. This is a pigeon, pigeonhole principle. So a simple achievable scheme is that the server in partition I just so, stores 1 by C by V of version I. So there is one partition that is large enough and can serve, can serve my user. Right. And this, 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 this scheme basically works. It's, sim it's simple in the sense each server just stores one version, but just large enough of that particular single version. Okay. The converse is actually fairly simple. I won't go into it because of time. So this is the summary. Uh, this lower bound is actually an interesting, clever information theory problem. You need some clever tricks. Uh, these numbers can actually be improved, and we did this in uh, Alert in 2014. But I'm giving these simpler versions because they're more intuitive, and they're also technically Improving these are more technically challenging, so it's more, more of a technicality. But it's still interesting, interesting exercises in network information theory. OK. So we started from this practical problem and formulated a coding problem. As mentioned, this is related to distributed storage. So you can, uh, we can add. You can you know, add more bells and whistles to this coding problem. Things like, I think yesterday Tom was mentioning that these versions typically tend to be correlated. Right? And that can bring storage cost benefits to this, this application. You can also add a bandwidth constraint to, and that might improve, help improve latency of these servers. So you can add many bells and whistles to this problem, and I think they're all interesting questions. Uh, but before. Uh, Going into that, there is something else that I'm currently interested in that's keeping me up late in the nights, and that is the question of whether I can go back from pra from this theory from theory back to practice. That is, do the information theoretic insights that that we have obtained from this problem do they give me fundamental uh, you know lower storage cost, lower bounds, and improvements in storage cost for this in this algorithmic world in this shared memory emulation world? This is something that I think is the first step to ratify this model, and this is something we are excited about. So with this, I conclude the talk. So maybe one question? You were saying before, if I understood correctly, that uh, answers could not, reads could not alternate between versions. And uh, when I when you show the multi-version coding, it seemed that depending on which subset is accessed, you would get uh, alternation between versions. I'm not sure what you mean by alternation. Reads can be concurrent with versions, but if there are too many writes in concurrent, then some correctness will be violated. Then I'll do something bad. So, so I'm worried about uh, a sequence of reads uh, which are concurrent with a certain write, and then you get version 1, version 2, version 1, version 2 for the reads. 
Yeah, the, if the rates are overlapping, that's, that might be fine. It's, it's more tricky than can be explained here, but uh, the, the rules of the game, yeah, we need to talk offline, I guess. It's a bit tricky. So the next speaker, uh, maybe while setting up, we can take, uh, you, you can set up, we can take one more, one more question while, while the next speaker is setting up. If there is one. Yeah. You never code across versions, right? So it looks like you don't really need to code across versions. That's the converse result that we have. At least you can, but you might not gain as much. Uh, you might not at least beat replication when we. The gaps are small. That's.